Today's webinar is the first in the series, State's Efforts, uh, State Efforts for Building an Effective, Diverse Teacher Workforce. We at NASB are delighted to do this in partnership with the National Conference of State Legislatures, a key partner for building shared state leadership and education policy across legislature, state boards, education chiefs and governors, and the Learning Policy Institute and Learning Forward, both recognized leaders in policy advocacy and work with states and districts in advancing le learning and teaching. Uh, let me say we want this to be a very interactive discussion today, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, after the presentation. Please keep your phones in silence mode and enter your questions in the chat box, and we will get to them then. Before introducing our panelists today, I want to briefly frame this webinar series and today's discussion. First, it is important to put this in the context of the Every Student Succeeds Act. We believe strongly that EFTA is both an opportunity and responsibility for states to commit to leading for equity to close persistent achievement and graduation gaps. First of these 10 equity commitments in this report is to prioritize equity, set and communicate an equity vision and measurable targets. It is also important for states to know and leverage EFTA Title II opportunities for educator development and to see best practices in what other states are doing. And we need this title funded fully, now and in the future. This is not the Title II of NCLB. It has been completely overhauled and reimagined around the use of evidence of effectiveness for the greater impact of teachers and leaders on students and uh, reimagined around this research-based definition of effective professional learning, which is sustained, intensive, job-embedded, collaborative, classroom-focused, and data-driven. Stephanie Hirsch of Learning Forward was a leading advocate for this definition in ESSA and will address this in her presentation. Recognizing students have different needs, equity can be defined as simply giving students what they need when they need it. Our equity vision for this series is equal access to deeper learning which I will define shortly, so that every student graduates ready for college, career, and civic life. This robust definition here emphasizes the importance of access to an education focused on meaningful learning that equips students for the contemporary world of work and society, taught by competent and caring educators who attend to a student's social, emotional, and academic needs. So these are the cross-cutting themes of this series. I'm going to identify them briefly here, and the panelists will unpack them more fully, make them more explicit, and of course this will come up in, in your uh, questions later. First, state leaders should have and communicate a bold vision of student learning grounded in equity and research as the core of their education system. This vision a powerful lens for viewing all other state policies, but especially for policies that develop and support the kinds of teachers needed to bring this vision to life in their students and schools. We see teachers as engaged in a complex, highly skilled profession, exercising expert judgment in the thousands of decisions they make every day. These next two themes go together. The importance of a systemic approach the teacher pipeline uh, that um, uh, advanced teachers uh, on career progression for greater mastery and leadership, and then also uh, concrete state and district policies and actions at all points uh, along those pipelines. We need to close teacher diversity gaps. National average is about 18% teachers of color or over 50% percent students of color, uh, but these gaps vary significantly locally. We need to close these because diversity and effectiveness go together. Students benefit in seeing themselves and their teachers, but the greatest benefit in parity is that all students can interact regularly with teachers of their own and different races and ethnicities. And finally, local context matters. The use of regional and local labor market data it's very important for analyzing issues of teacher shortages and specific needs for diverse, effective teachers. Deeper learning 
support greater academic content mastery through understanding the why of learning and applied learning. It engages students' intrinsic motivation to learn and strengthens their problem solving and critical thinking. Most importantly, for educating students to navigate the rapidly changing world of work, technology, and society, it strengthens their ability to transfer knowledge and skills to new situations, jobs, and uh, problems. David Conley uh, did a crosswalk of deeper learning against the College Career Readiness Standards a few years ago, and he found that deeper learning reinforced and exceeded uh, those standards with its greater emphasis on communication and collaboration and its additional focus on learning to learn and a growth mindset. Uh, this uh, graphic um, I think is a, a, a very good way to show how you can integrate deeper learning uh, with academic content. You can see on the two columns on the left of uh, the uh, academic content, and then the two on the, on the right are the deeper learning. Uh, this is also a, a good illustration uh, for graduation pathways uh, that focus on three components of academic content, uh, post-secondary goals, and employability skills. Finally, uh, I have emphasized deeper learning in this opening as a primary equity strategy to say that this is what teachers need to be able to teach and also exemplify themselves. These are the three high leverage policy areas in a uh, teacher pipeline uh, where this can happen. We want teacher preparation that's closely aligned to school expectations and best practices and instruction so graduates are learner ready day one. We want professional development as ongoing coaching, training, uh, practice, collaboration, teachers learning uh, from each other, and reflection uh, for their greater mastery. And then finally, we, we want career progressions that are based on incentives, support, and accountability for continuous improvement in teaching and exemplifying deeper learning. And all of us on this panel uh, strongly believe that schools are the primary places of adult learning. And this last point brings me to our panelists today on leveraging ESSA's Title II for job embedded professional development. I'm delighted to introduce Stephanie Hirsch from Learning Forward, uh, Maria Heiler from LPI, and Shelley Rouser from the D Delaware Department of Education, and we hope that maybe Donna Johnson, the Executive Director of the Delaware State Board of Education, may also be able to join us uh, due to calendar changes due to the snowstorm. Uh, please note their bios are in the um, uh, chat box. And also, um, I do want to apologize. Again, we're in a snowstorm, and there may be some audio uh, issues. And that, if you do have these, uh, try to enable the audio via the telephone. And again, I I'm very sorry. So now I will hand it over to Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Don, and thank you so much to our partners um, at NASB, at LPI, at NCSL, and I also recognize that there are many, many experts in the room today, and so I look forward to um, brief remarks and then the opportunity to engage in a conversation. And I hope that you all will do that with each other. We have representatives here from numerous state boards of education. We have experts from CCSSO and uh, many experts from our SEAs. Um, also, I noticed our um, Learning Forward president, Alan Ingram, is in the room as well, a former deputy commissioner himself. So don't rely just on your presenters. Um, rely on all of the expertise among the colleagues who are sharing this time today with you. I love the uh, subject of this, partic of this webinar, At School Everyone's Job is to Learn, and um, 
that's where I intend to focus my remarks. And I'm having a bit of a challenge forwarding, but I'll get it to work. There we go. So I am hopeful that most individuals in the room are familiar with Learning Forward. If not, um, you can find our website below. Um, we are very proud of the fact that we focus, we focus solely on the relationship of improving educator performance in order to improve student performance. And Don laid out a beautiful vision for what we want um, for students, um, particularly um, using deeper learning as the frame for that. And no matter the vision that we want for students, because we all want more than what we have today, um, we also have to recognize that in order to achieve this, that we need to transform classroom instruction. And if we intend to really transform classroom instruction, then we need to think about how we transform professional learning. And it can't be the sit and get or drive by. Um, neither one of those will help us get there. And as a, it's fortunate that the change in ESSA and, um, and changes that states made long before the change in ESSA are helping us to move in this direction. As an organization, we hold some assumptions about the importance of professional learning to achieve this new vision for deeper learning. And for this particular webinar, I focus on that fourth one, that we hold that the most powerful professional learning occurs among teachers in learning teams committed to continuous improvement. I invite you to look later at the other assumptions and to see what, to what degree you agree or disagree, or are they part of uh, what, un what underlies the planning within your state and within your district to focus on and improve professional learning for educators. But if you believe that the most powerful professional learning occurs among teachers in learning teams, then hopefully you'll embrace this very simple vision, a learning team for every teacher. Uh, no teacher should work in isolation. No teacher should have to rely solely on um, their own knowledge and skills in order to support the diverse needs that every teacher faces every day in classrooms. And as Don mentioned, we worked a long time with a lot of people, um, people in this room and people outside this room today to change the definition of professional development that could have been considered a laundry list to one that really acknowledges what teachers have said for years is most valuable to them. The fact that it is intensive, collaborative, it's focused at the classroom level. It, it is job embedded. It focuses on what do teachers need to do tomorrow, and it is driven by data. So at Learning Forward, what we tried to do was translate that definition into meaningful collaborative learning for teachers. And this is one piece from the work that we do around intentional professional learning communities. While I'm sure many of you know many places that engage in professional learning communities, often they may have good conversation, but they may not result in powerful changes in the classroom. And so we propose a process um, that is very intentional about the steps learning teams work through in order to get the outcomes that we want to see for both the educators and the students. My intention today is not to go deep into those stages, but to recognize that no matter what system you adopt for supporting collaborative teams, that you can clearly identify the stages, the steps, and the outcomes that you want from each. Then in order to build the conditions and the context for supporting highly productive learning teams, we. Um, have presented in many of your states have adopted the standards for professional learning. It outlines what is absolutely essential if we expect those learning teams, if we expect job embedded professional learning to truly provide the kind of support teachers need to meet the needs of all students in their classroom. We're also proud of the fact that many of the states represented in the room today 
are, have adopted the standards for professional learning. Some of you have adopted the most recent version. Some of you are still operating under older versions, but just the commitment that we want all teachers to experience great professional learning, and so we have these standards that define them for us. And when I think again about the subject matter of this webinar and how I can and we can be most helpful to you and think about, so what's the role at the state level? Three things to consider that we can talk about later is, do you have a vision for professional learning? Does it include a definition? Does that definition align um, with the new definition within ESSA? Then once you set a definition and adopt your own standards or guidelines that you want to be used in the planning and the implementation and the assessment of professional learning, then take time to assess where you are currently. Um, how well does the professional learning within your state um, align to that vision? Does it really meet the new definition um, under ESSA? And once you've done that assessment, determine the next um, strategic priorities and actions that you'll take for your state and I always encourage people limit 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 what are the two or three things that you as a state can do that can have the greatest impact um, in terms of moving closer to that vision um, I'd like to mention that we have lots of resources to help you I'd say most of these up here I think except for a couple are absolutely free and I'm always willing to share anything if you don't have the dollars um, to buy a book or something like that. And one of the best resources um, will be through the Learning Forward ESSA page. And I've given you the link there as well. So um, I hope that just starts, serves as a big picture for the definition because I know um, that the next part of this, Maria is going to go into even more detail that I think will be helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Don. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with the partners, NASB and Learning Forward, and share some of the research that we have done at Learning Policy Institute around supporting effective teacher development, looking um, specifically at what the research <clears throat> says about teacher professional development that impacts student learning. So as we all know, since uh, as, as Stephanie acknowledges there's lots of experts in the room. There's been an active conversation about both the value and the design of teacher professional development. And fortunately, research has provided us some insights to the questions um, that have come up. While it's certainly true that professional development for teachers is not all high quality, we've learned a lot in recent years about what makes some PD programs more effective for teacher and student learning than others. <clears throat> Traditionally, teacher professional development has often been lecture-based, what might be called sit-and-get or drive-by learning, that offers the same content and strategies to all teachers, regardless of their skills and experiences, and is largely divorced from teachers' day-to-day -day practices in their classrooms. And what we want for teacher professional development is to reflect what we want for our students in K-12 classrooms. We want rich, deeper learning experiences that really impact um, teacher learning and improve practice. So the paradigm shift um, is noted in rigorous research um, shows that PD programs with an impact on student learning follow a different model defined by seven core elements. Strong PD is focused on the content that teachers teach in their classrooms. Programs demonstrate this characteristic when, for example, they offer opportunities for teachers to construct lessons and units for a new curriculum or investigate how students learn specific contexts in a subject area. Unlike lecture-based or sit-and-get PD, active learning offers teachers a chance to meaningfully engage with new concepts and teaching strategies by actually doing them. Active learning strategies include analysis, discussion, observation, and direct practice. Stephanie spent a lot of time talking about collaboration, and um, collaboration can take many forms, with teachers working one-on-one -on -one with a coach in a small group or as part of a professional learning community that extends beyond the school. And it can occur remotely using technology or be in person. 
Collaboration often occurs in job embedded contexts as teachers plan together, offer each other feedback, and problem solve specifically about their students. The fourth key feature is models. By providing teachers with models of effective teaching, PD programs offer educators a clear vision of best practices. There are many types of models that can be employed to accomplish this purpose, including curricular resources like lesson or unit plans, student work, teaching cases, and observations of peer or master teachers. Effective PD programs also provide coaching and other expert support to facilitate teacher learning. These experts, usually educators themselves, often lead teachers through the active and engaging learning experiences I've been sharing about, but they also tailor specific advice and counsel to the needs of individual teachers. Rather than providing a one-size-fits-all experience, experience, coaching enables programs to meet individual teachers where they're at and support improvement. Coaching often entails feedback and reflection on teacher practice, but we found that powerful teaching, teacher learning opportunities, regardless of format, offer time for teachers to engage in these activities. While these practices are distinct, they often work together to support teachers as they move towards the expert visions of practice articulated by PD. And we know that accomplishing all of this takes time. So effective PD must be sustained, must be of sustained duration. Research has not offered any magic number of hours for effective programs. Instead, it indicates that providing opportunities for teachers to study deeply and then apply their knowledge in cycles of inquiry over time is essential. Often this involves intensive workshops and that set teachers up to apply new approaches in the classroom and then opportunities to reconnect to debrief and problem solve together. But even the best designed PD may encounter challenges with implementation that limit its effectiveness. For example, there are any number of school-level challenges that have been shown to be obstacles to effective professional development, including inadequate resources, and this includes financial support, but also can be materials such as equipment for lab experiments or project-based learning, and even in the most um, extreme cases, the lack of books or basic materials. Teachers also sometimes contend with limited opportunity to use newly acquired knowledge in their classrooms. So in one study that we reviewed, a teacher received PD-related to science instruction in her elementary classroom, only to have time for science instruction removed from the schedule entirely. School culture can have a powerful, can prove to be a powerful obstacle, obstacle to effective professional development. For example, in one school, teachers mistrusted the leadership and therefore lacked buy-in to the mandated PD offered, even though it was of high quality. This is one reason that school leadership is very essential when thinking about professional development for teachers. Challenges to implementing effective PD extend beyond the classroom and the school. These challenges include a lack of alignment between the teachers, between what teachers feel they need to learn to best meet their students' needs and district initiatives and priorities. Likewise, there's often a disconnect between state and local policies. For example, states generally require seat time for recertification, which in turn encourages districts to organize one-off workshops that are easy to schedule and require less human and financial resources than do evidence-based approaches to, de to professional development like I've shared. Relatedly, very few states and districts have robust tracking systems for professional development that include both quality as well as quantity. Without such systems in place, it's hard to adopt and implement professional learning for teachers that is evidence-based and designed to address potential obstacles. All of these challenges can be addressed through thoughtful policies and more strategic implementation. That's the good news. So just as the standards that Stephanie mentioned, uh, we can start to adopt standards for professional development to guide the design, evaluation, and funding of professional learning provided to educators. Evaluating and redesigning the use of time and school schedules to increase opportunities for professional learning collaboration, including expert coaching and collaborative planning, 
is a way to think about school schedules and redesigning schools. Key to this are leaders that understand and have skills necessary to undertake organizational redesigns, which we'll talk about later. Conducting needs assessments to identify what teachers feel they most need to help their students learn best is important because teachers need to have input into the types of PD that is available to them. The development of expert teachers as mentors and coaches to support teacher learning. States and districts could also integrate professional learning into SS school improvement initiatives, such as efforts to use student data to inform instruction or create a positive and inclusive learning environment. There could also be provisions for technology facilitated opportunities for professional learning and coaching, especially in support of rural communities, and provide opportunities for collaboration using funding under Titles II and IV. And finally, policymakers can provide flexible funding and continuing education units for learning opportunities that include sustained engagement and high impact professional learning opportunities, not just traditional workshops. So I'm going to pass the mic over um, now and I look forward to having a discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelley Rauter, and I serve as the Director of K-12 Initiatives and Educator Engagement at the Delaware Department of Education. Uh, so, so far this afternoon, you've heard about the opportunities that come with ESSA for equity and excellence in our schools and at the local and state system levels. Uh, the Learning Policy Institute has set the stage by naming the paradigm shift and policy implications and Learning Forward has spoken to the necessary conditions for uh, and shared tools that will help us as leaders change the effectiveness of and impact of professional learning for educators. Um, we all know that there's a certain cascade effect of the quality of professional learning for educators. And we know that the quality of learning in, uh, or the quality of learning in our schools as a whole. As we adopted the new college and career ready standards for students in Delaware, it became increasingly clear that we needed equally rigorous standards for the quality of professional learning for educators as well. So in 2012, Delaware adopted the Learning Forward Standards as our own, but quite frankly, they were not getting the same level of attention as we focused on the standards for instruction and less on our own um, adopted professional learning standards. In fact, um, as you see here, our most recent health survey in Delaware reveals um, that there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. 93% of our teachers are reporting that they were being held to high standards for instruction with students, but just 50% felt like the PD was differentiated to meet their needs. And less than 50% reported that there was a culture for evaluating the impact of that professional learning and that those results were communicated to them. So we knew that there was work to do. So in 2012, we launched an initiative called Common Ground for the Common Core, and we kept that initiative going for three years with two goals in mind that are aimed at really both levels of professional learning. On the one hand, it supported our teachers and principals with implementation of the newly adopted college and career ready standards. But at the same time, we were modeling the expectations that we held for professional learning. Uh, putting the adopted standards, the learning forward standards that we adopted, putting those standards into action, putting a laser focus on implementation uh, and evaluation, too, of the learning forward standards that were highlighted, and responsiveness to needs, a program that evolved each year responsive to what we were seeing in the field with implementation based on our feedback loops with the participants. So we were challenging ourselves to provide the same sort of professional learning that we wanted for all educators in the state. So just as we were winding down this Common Ground initiative and adjusting our approach, the Mirage Report study was released, and it played a key role in our efforts to shift our attention from state-led professional learning to an approach that helped our schools 
um, and the districts that supported them in redefining, reevaluating, and reinventing professional learning that's based on their very own specific local needs. We launched um, a new initiative called Reimagining Professional Learning. It uh, incentivized schools with grants and they were able to paint the picture of what they could do to reimagine professional learning in their school if only they had the resources to do it. So our strategy changed in the right way and at the right time, um, but our focus remained the same. This, uh, this uh, slide actually begins to capture um, the two approaches that we had. Um, we, on the macro state strategy level through the Common Ground Professional Learning Initiative, as well as what we did with the Reimagining Professional Learning Grant at more of the micro, local, district charter level um, as far as our strategy there. So first, the focus on implementation of the standards um, through understanding the shift, and then that shifted into us having schools apply that knowledge of the standards through high quality professional learning and high quality uh, instructional materials. Um, next, there was a focus on evaluating the quality of professional learning. That was certainly probably the biggest paradigm shift for us at the state, and it continues to be. At the state level, uh, when we initiated the Common Ground Initiative, we knew that that was going to be the biggest shift in our approach to professional learning. And we had Dr. Thomas Dusky come to Delaware and do training on evaluating the impact of professional learning on practice and student learning using his five levels of professional development evaluation. That training was especially geared towards central office directors of instruction. Um, in fact, Dr. Dusky, who is, is actually doing a webinar for Delaware as we speak, snow or shine, um, for those grant schools. We introduced protocols also, um, such as feed forward feedback, and tools such as a gusty placemat um, that now reimagining schools, going down to the micro level, are using those same tools to evaluate the impact of their school-specific professional learning on student learning and, and, teacher, um, and teacher practice. And we have DOE liaisons that check in with those schools on evidence of their impact. Also, on implementation of the professional learning standards as a whole, what started as modeling of a backwards design from the professional learning standards through our state template with more state-level state level goals around understanding the standards deeply has now evolved into a similar template, but one that's grounded in a needs assessment, revealing where both the student learning needs are and using Learning Forward Standards Assessment Inventory, the SAI, measuring where the needs are for school systems to, per, to really support the professional learning of educators. And it's also worth mentioning that just as the schools have check-ins with department liaisons, we too update our state board from time to time with evidence of implementation and impact. And I'm happy to share more about this, and Donna Johnson will share more about this when we have time for discussion in just a bit. We're happy to share uh, resources and the tools that we use with schools, the processes that have been helpful, the lessons learned, the partnerships that have made all the difference, such as those partnerships with Learning Forward and with the Mid-Atlantic Comprehensive Center uh, MAC at West Ed. We're also going to share those behind the scenes routines of our department that kept the work moving along. But in a nutshell, this is what our schools are committing to, and this is the work of the DOE liaisons to support them in doing it. It's about responsive professional learning that's grounded in clear learning goals and evaluated. It is about high quality instruction through high quality instructional materials for students. And it's also about something that Stephanie uh, spoke to earlier, a cycle of inquiry. Just as we ask teachers to engage in the cycle of inquiry around student learning, we're applying those stages of learning that Stephanie referenced, the, the analysis of goals, the setting goals, et cetera so that they are equally focused on the quality of um, the professional learning. It's also about ownership at all levels. Uh, why they are school-based plans, it's about the district's engagement with them, as well as the teacher voice. So all three levels sign on to the plans that they propose. And finally, a willingness to align their learning systems and to reallocate resources to align with those priorities. 
this next slide summarizes the uh, grant requirements, but especially uh, I'd like to call attention to the last two bullets. Um, we have found that uh, two things really came out with our school. Um, one was around a focus on, um, on evaluating PL and on leading change, and especially the learning forward standard of learning design. And so we found that having periodic professional learning sessions for the grant leaders was helpful, and also changing the course of our check-ins with districts to more focus in on those areas. And at this time, if we're able to have Donna join us. I'm here, Shelley. Donna, are you there? Great. Thank you so much. And I am just excited that Delaware is really able to show the partnership that our Department of Education and our State Board of Education has been able to foster on this and many other issues. And as we often talk about in many of the webinars, that NASB puts on is really trying to take a look at connecting all of this great work and initiatives and grounding that back into what is the role, the opportunity, and the responsibility of our state boards. And one of the things that Delaware has really tried to stay true to is making sure that the responsibility of voting on and making policy does not end with that action. That the board has taken that responsibility in terms of monitoring and asking for feedback on the implementation of the policy of the policies that they have approved. So one of the things that we've really taken a look at is asking the department, as Shelley talked about, was to regularly bring in an update on where are we with standards implementation, where are we with the implementation of our professional learning standards, how is that connecting into the performance gaps that we're seeing and what supports are being given to schools. So really utilizing those, those three powers that the State Board has, which is the power of the question and, and taking that policy action that we've had and following up on it. The policy to convene, bringing together groups of people for workshops or presentations to the board or presentations to stakeholder groups to talk about these initiatives and further share these ideas, and then most impo importantly, the, pol the power of the voice and making sure that board members are utilizing their voice to advocate for the changes that are necessary to improve student learning for each and every one of our children. Thanks, Donna. <clears throat> okay. Well. Thank you so much, uh, Donna and Shelley, Maria, Stephanie. And uh, now we have to we have to take full advantage of the time we have for uh, questions. And um, and as Stephanie mentioned, we really do have extraordinary expertise in, in all of the participants. So please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions and, and why you think of those. I'm going to start with a follow up for um, Shelley and Donna. Uh, in regard to the collaboration that you've had uh, with the State Board and, and, the, and the Education Department, uh, and given that these teacher pipelines have so many entry points, can you talk about some of the lessons learned um, for how you determine priorities and, um, and identifying strategies uh, for our other State Board members and, and Education Department members? You know, I think I think I'd would want Shelley to kind of talk about the lessons learned from the aspect of the work that they've done around re, you know, kind of reimagining professional learning and then using the data and the feedback that they've received really kind of and getting that information back to state boards helps state boards advocate for and drive to address the, whether it be opportunities for improvement or addressing any hurdles that policy may get in the way of success. So I would like Shelley to talk about some of the ways that they've used the data that they've collected to improve their process. Thanks, Donna. Okay. And so um, it's really, it was really important for us that as we, um, as we thought through the elements that were necessary for our schools, our districts to move forward professional learning, 
that we were constantly flipping the mirror and looking at our own state practices and the degree to which we were modeling them. And so that's why we took this approach in uh, even sharing with all of you this afternoon, this macro level and micro level, and really us looking at a state agency as to whether or not we are studying our own evidence of impact of what we are doing on the field, just as they are looking at their own school level professional le learning and how, how it's impacting students and teachers. And so um, our team actually has processes that start in the summer before the school even starts the plan. Um, they're building their plans right now as we speak. We're bringing on year three schools. But once we name those schools, our, our staff actually immediately reaches out to the schools to even work with them on their own evaluation instrument. And that was actually a change between um, year one and year two. We noticed that um, the evaluation is, we knew that the evaluation part would be the toughest shift. But we also um, underestimated, I guess, the need to support our schools with creating tools for that evaluation to take place, not after the fact, but as the professional learning is rolling out throughout the school year. And so in the summer months, our DOE liaisons are assigned to a school. And they reach out to that school to sit down with them and help them create tools unique to their own area of focus and actually uh, identify what will be evidence. What do you predict will be evidence that what you're doing is having an impact? To the point of uh, the information that we're able to share with the State um, Board of Education, that data is helping our schools have responsive professional learning, but that data is also providing um, support to us as a state agency. And we're able to um, leverage the power of the board to convene the voice um, to their questions to help make this stronger and stronger um, year by year, I would say. I hope that's helpful and that answers all sorts of the questions. Yeah, absolutely. I would add one thing to boards. When you have this information being presented to you from whether it be your department or if you have the opportunity to bring schools in and hear directly from them what's working and what's not working, one of the most helpful questions that our board members have asked people that are implementing this on the ground and working directly in our schools is what policy or practice gets in the way of doing what you believe needs to be done to meet the needs of our students and really trying to look at and then unpack is that a policy hurdle is it an implementation hurdle? And how can we address what those challenges are to help our educators meet the needs of our students? OK, well, uh, well thank you both. Let me continue uh, uh, with some follow-up questions that we have in the chat box. And then we'll, we'll um, go on to some other questions. Um, but again, for you, Shelly and Donna, uh, we have a question about how are you planning to sustain funding? Uh, the new models beyond the grant program period in schools? And then, Shelley, uh, can you give further examples of the types of evidence that school districts are using to demonstrate professional learning? Sure. Um, well, one of the things I'll say is um, we are committed to putting our resources to this um, for the next few years. Um, and so we have planned for that with our budget to support schools. And um, as we did with the former initiative that I'd mentioned, Common Ground, we'll be looking at um, you know, how we have sort of have a gradual release of responsibility and what the next level of support will be. And we're not sure what that next level of support will be, and certainly resources will play a part in that. But there is a commitment to that for the next couple of years. And so we began to see we kind of reached that tipping point where we have um, these, we were able to reach enough schools to, um, to see enough districts with schools that have had this opportunity. Um, as far as the evidence that uh, we are seeing from schools, um, one thing that we, well, of course, there's the obvious evidence. Well, I'll start with saying that the evidence is that it's at the multiple levels of best use evaluation. And so when they build their plan out, we help them look at each of those five levels, which are things like the satisfaction of professional learning, the obvious things like the surveys um, that Gus T. jokingly calls um, their happiness quotient as they're walking out of the door of training, 
how are they responding to it. But bigger than that, um, it is about the knowledge and skills that we see. And so that often comes in the play, uh, in, the, in the way of walkthrough tools. Um, it can also come from flipping focus groups, flipping professional learning communities into focus groups. And uh, with key questions, the um, information coming from those focus groups, those CLCs, funnels up to the schools as a qualitative measure. Uh, sometimes it's very real things like, um, you know, pre and post things to see where teachers are. And then as you go on, um, it's also about um, Gusky's level three, the support systems that are in place, and finally things like teacher practice and walkthrough tools and peer visits that teachers do of each other, and of course the evidence that's bubbling up from PLCs um, as, as far as student learning artifacts. So those are some of the things, and our schools have gotten really creative with some of the things that they pull to serve as data sources to inform their professional learning, but those are a few examples. Oh, and oh, to, to sorry, help sorry. everyone, I just added into the chat box a presentation from the June State Board of Education meeting in Delaware where we had not only the department but also representatives who had received these grants yep. showcase and demonstrate some of the work that they had done and the results that they were getting. There are also a couple ways in which the department has given that feedback back to the board when they presented assessment data, they've connected that back to talk about the impact of increase in performance that was seen by schools that had taken advantage of some of these grants. Okay, that's great. And one more question for, for you. Uh, is, the, uh, is there a sample or a copy of your Delaware survey available for uh, participants? So as far as our survey is, um, our, our surveys now. Um, we, as far as analyzing the where schools are in terms of their quality of professional learning, their implementation of the Learning Forward and Delaware Professional Learning Standards, we utilize the SAI. So the Standards Assessment Inventory is our go-to tool for giving a pre-post and letting schools uh, actually plant or, or, or um, pose what their next steps are in terms of implementation of the standards. In terms of professional learning surveys themselves, um, we have developed a bank of questions that we have our schools tap into so that their questions go beyond did I like it to addressing some of those other levels of Gusky's uh, framework. But we do not have um, standard surveys. In fact, we actually encourage our schools to take our, our sample questions and really customize them to the very specific things that they are focused on in their grant. We suggest the same thing of them when it comes to their walkthrough tools so that their data is specific and not general. But we certainly could give you examples from our schools, and we'd be happy to share that if you follow up with me after the webinar. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to uh, open this now to uh, the other panelists. And, and Stephanie, uh, can you talk about the role that, that partnerships played in, in your work with state? Um, sure, and one of the things I'd like to say before I answer that question is I just want to um, give accolades to Delaware and all of the work that it's done in implementing the standards and when we had the opportunity to visit um, the schools and to watch the work that they did um, in planning effective school-based job embedded professional learning it's it's pretty amazing and so um, just accolades there and I know if I visited other states and places I know I would probably see similar work that would just um, make me swell in pride about the great work that takes place within our um, districts in terms of Partnerships, um, we really, we think everything is about collaboration. I know um, Maria reinforced that that was kind of the message of um, my remarks at the beginning. Um, and it's also about readiness. Uh, people are at different stages of change and recognizing that different people have different kinds of expertise. I think um, bringing as many different voices to the table and dealing with the challenges that you can anticipate up front 
will always position you better for making the kinds of changes that you want to make um, going forward. Um, and all of the organizations represented um, in this webinar as well as uh, participants in the conversation I know are all eager to help states if um, it's the right time for that organization, its perspective, um, and the resources it has to offer. We want to give anything away that we think will help move a state along um, its agenda toward helping all students achieve at high levels. Uh, well, well, thank you, Stephanie, and I'd like to um, amplify your praise for Delaware. Uh, they really have done so much good work uh, in, in um, really teacher pipelines as a whole. Uh, one of the problems with, the, with these webinars is we just don't have enough time for each um, panelist. Uh, but let me uh, ask this next question for Maria. Uh, Maria, uh, uh, given this vision of professional learning uh, that we've shared in this uh, webinar, um, how can that support state and district efforts to recruit and retain a more diverse teacher workforce? Thank you for asking that question, um, Don. I think that we have to look at what the research says, and um, there's reports that LPI has put out, um, several reports recently on recruitment and retention of teachers in general and um, in teachers, teachers of color particularly. And um, what we find is that the research shows that teachers of color are leaving the classroom um, at higher rates than uh, white teachers. And so what are some of the reasons? Uh, well, we know that teachers of color are two times as likely to enter through alternative routes. And that um, also speaks to the fact that teachers who are underprepared are often, um, teachers who are underprepared to teach leave the classroom at higher rates than those with adequate professions. And we know that uh, preparation programs look different from um, traditional and alternative, and quality varies. Um, but one of the things that professional development can do is step in for some of the gaps in learning and preparation that teachers of color might have um, missed through their preparation. The other thing is that teachers of color are more likely to teach in schools serving students from low income um, backgrounds um, and in low resource schools. So we can ask what type of professional development is even available in those schools and look at school funding to help to um, improve the quality of professional development um, for teachers of colors in under-resourced schools. Additionally, um, professional, and professional development in general um, can also help to improve the work conditions for all teachers. One of the things that we um, know from research is that uh, working conditions matter a great deal in terms of teacher retention. And schools can be places where, um, just like in society, there can be um, racism or mic microaggressions. And so when we have professional developments that professional development opportunities that help all teachers to understand um, positive working environments and think about issues around um, race, culture, um, language, social economic st status, all of those um, social identifiers, when we have teachers learning together about those things, um, that helps to improve the learning environment in schools, not only for students, but for teachers as well. Well, well, thank you, Maria. And I do want to let everyone know that uh, uh, we will be addressing uh, the diversity gaps, uh, you know, explicitly in the other webinars that we'll be hosting, and I'll mention those at the end. Um, we are running late on time, but I would like to ask one more question because uh, we had such a great uh, panel and, and participants, and I want to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, let me open this up to uh, everyone. Um, how can states support districts in creating communities of practice where teachers can learn uh, from each other? Well, uh, this is Stephanie, and I'll start, and then the rest of you can add to my list. I think some of these things were mentioned. Um, I think, Maria, you mentioned about time. So I think states can help districts find different models for creating the time that you need for communities of practice. I think um, states can take the lead in building uh, training for 
teacher leaders and team leaders for communities of practice so that you have quality and consistency in what occurs within those communities. Um, I think that the state, often in some states, they're bringing together schools and or systems with common needs and common problems so that they have the opportunity to work collectively on sharing the problem as well as experiencing a high functioning community of practice. And lastly, I always want to think about how you can incentivize uh, uh, districts to adopt um, community of practice models that meet certain criteria that the state may choose to identify. This is Shelley, and I would add to that, and I would especially pay attention to what Stephanie shared about teacher leaders. I think that states can use the power of convening to um, provide opportunities for teacher leaders that's been integral to our successes. We may not be able to, as a state, reach every teacher, but if we can empower our schools and build their capacity, uh, we found a lot of success with teacher leader initiatives. Uh, at the school level, pulling teachers who are able to then be that uh, go-to person in their school. So um, not underestimating also the power of bringing them together, not just to focus on the content, the standards, the learning as we would traditionally think of it, but also uh, when we bring those teacher leaders together to also make sure that there's equal time paid to the skills that they need to actually serve as teacher leaders. One thing that we learned early on is that when we pull teacher leaders together, it's one thing to um, provide good learning. It's another thing to empower them to be able to be leaders back in their schools. And so we've been spending a lot of time on uh, building up their confidence along those lines, too, so that they really are a strong resource for schools. OK, and we also have a question from Lisa. Um, about um, uh, Gusky and his work and resources. Is there a, a go-to site um, and or progression of learning? Can anyone address that? I can. Um, our, we have, of course, depended on his book, um, Evaluating Professional Learning. Um, so we are deeply grounded in that. There are some other resources that you'll find. One of them that I would say is just super important and really simple and straightforward is um, Gusky has a nice uh, one-pager, two-pager that outlines the five levels, and it gives examples of the types of evidence that you would look for at each level. And it also gives examples of the kinds of questions that you would ask yourself in planning and in executing to think about professional learning, evaluating professional learning in new ways. And that simple two-pager has been key for us, and in fact, is what inspired what we call in Delaware our Gusky placemat, which basically is just a tool that schools can use to plan with the end in mind, plan with their evidence, and then back map from there in terms of what they're actually going to um, train on. So they use the levels kind of sequentially, levels one to five, to evaluate. But when they're planning, they start with the end in mind student learning and work their way back um, to what they'll actually do. And um, we're happy to share the Gusky placement. OK, thank you. And now I'm just going to finally point out and, and recognize uh, Saroja Warner. Uh, and, and please do look at the resource that she provided, the webinar um, uh, that shows the implications of biases of, of teachers on school disciplinary practices, and particularly the impact on black girls. Um, we are now going to close. And I can't thank our panelists enough. I can't thank our participants. Um, I do want to show you that we have these resources, and we can also, all of us, uh, are very happy. Here's our contact information to provide any additional um, follow-up you would like. Please feel free to contact us. And uh, I do want to say uh, that we are so excited about this launch. I can't believe the incredible work of our communications director, Renee, and everyone, and all of you for um, having just an absolutely great launch in this uh, snowstorm <laughs> under difficult conditions. Uh, so here are the upcoming webinars in this series, April 25th 
Uh, we will have one on teacher leadership, career ladders, and relicensure in support of deeper learning. And then on May 30th, uh, we'll have a webinar on bridging the continuum, teacher preparation and induction for deeper learning. And, uh, and there you see uh, the details uh, for getting more information about those webinars. So with that, I just um, am so pleased and thank you so much. And I really do hope that all of you will continue to join uh, this series and this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.